we've had multiple webinars. This is, I think, the third one we are having or the fourth. Uh, before we begin, I would like to first uh, do a land acknowledgement and acknowledge that we are convening on the Ohlone indigenous people's land. And this is really important to do so in general and also in the context of working around Palestine and the land of the Palestinian people. Uh, we will be talking more about that. I also want us to take a moment of silence to honor all those who have fallen in the fight for freedom as victims of police brutality and racial violence and militarization and people who had fought to, for, to preserve justice and peace for all of us. Thank you. I turn it over to Pastor Michael Yoshi now to take over and uh, moderate this. Okay. Thank you, uh, Dr. Abdelhadi. Um, so for the students, my name is Michael Yoshi. Uh, I have been pastoring the Buena Vista United Methodist Church in Alameda for over 30 years, uh, getting ready to retire actually the next couple, few days. Uh, but I've also been an advisor for the Ahmed program and Prior to that, uh, I was also on the committee that was um, uh, trying to um, get the Ahmed program to San Francisco State University. So I've seen the trajectory of the program come to the university and also uh, when Dr. Abdelhadi came to run the program as its uh, director. So we've had a relationship for many years with the program. And um, unfortunately, I've also witnessed many of the attacks, uh, anti-Muslim attacks against the Ahmed program and the, um, uh, and, and specifically Dr. Abdelhadi. And uh, we wanna just take a moment um, as we're convening today, um, because we recognize as Dr. Abdelhadi is teaching courses on Arab studies and Islamophobia, um, the Ahmed program and and Dr. Abdelhadi herself have been subject to smears and attacks um, that really exemplify what that's all about. We know that in the last couple of years, there's been the um, Muslim ban taking place, you know, at the different levels of our administration and uh, reinforced by the Supreme Court. And so policies reinforce the kinds of things that go on uh, in people's everyday lives. So some of you who are students who come from Muslim backgrounds, Arab backgrounds, we know that you've been living through very difficult times. And so we come to this space uh, with expressions of our solidarity as we look to explore what it means to continue to build out solidarity with others. Um, and uh, for today, um, it's, it's a great opportunity for me to be a co-host with Dr. Abdahadi for the class to bring in some of the partners that we have worked with in our community of Buena Vista over uh, the last several years and to have this conversation about what it means to build greater solidarity uh, through interfaith, intersectional and interethnic uh, relationship building. And so I have some really great guests uh, connected to us and in our extended community. I want to thank Buena Vista Church for agreeing to co-sponsor today as well. And the intention there is to continue to build that relationship that we've had for many years and also Friends of Wadi Fukin. Uh, for co-sponsoring today as well. So I want to welcome to the students and to uh, some of our church members who are here as well as community members who are joining us for today. And um, the format today will have uh, several panelists who have invited to be with us today uh, to share a bit about themselves, their social justice work, and particularly today because we are a United Methodist Church and a Christian organization there's this element of what it means to bring the Christian faith into interfaith circles and intersectional circles as well. Not always talked about, but something that's significant for us to understand. So that each of the panelists will speak to the issues that they've been working on and what they bring from their own uh, personal narrative uh, as persons um, in this world. And then after that, uh, we'll share some uh, dialogue with our panelists then open it up to Q&A from the listening audience and some remarks from Dr. Abdelhadi. And then we'll have some closing comments from our panelists as well. Um, so with that, 
Uh, I want to uh, invite our first speaker uh, who's coming in to us from Bethlehem, uh, Daniel Benura. He is with the uh, Bethlehem uh, Bible College, a Christian, but with an MA in Islamic studies and a PhD candidate in Quranic studies. And so his intersection of interests really uh, help to uh, give us some context for today. So Daniel. Thank you, Pastor Michael. I am uh, I'm very pleased and very honored to be with, with all of you in this in this meeting. Um, it's 9 p.m. right now in, in Palestine. So good evening to all of you. Um, uh, it's very it's very it's very exciting for me to be able to come and share with you my thoughts and can I share about also what I've been do, been doing as a as a, as a lecturer at Bethlehem Bible College and as a Palestinian as a also as a Palestinian Christian and and how that identity this confusing identity to many has been um, uh, very instrumental in my my efforts and the efforts of many Palestinian Christians to speak up about the injustice that we face here and to reclaim uh, the Bible for us, especially when we see many Christians and many Jews have weaponized the Bible against us. And in many respects, we are trying to uh, make the Bible a text for us, making God and Christ to be our God and our Christ, not the God and Christ of those who come and attack us. And this, is, and this has been the, the process of decolonizing the Bible for many Palestinian Christians in the last, especially in the last 30 years, with an, an even going back before with a, what we call the rise of Palestinian liber liberation theology, where many Christians, especially, um, I, can, I have to mention Father Naim Atik, the father of Palestinian liberation theology, uh, theology who basically tried to find that uh, the text of the Bible to be that text of liberation and freedom and salvation for Palestinians as well. Um, I don't have to share much about uh, the Palestinian struggle. Uh, I'm, I'm sure all of you know, are aware of what's been happening in Palestine for the last 70 years. It's been a process of settler colonialism, uh, ethnic cleansing of Palestinians. Uh, and the lat latest episode of this is the uh, plan to annex the Jordan Valley uh, by Israel in the beginning of July, in, in a few days, uh, which is a de facto, I mean, the, the Jordan Valley has already been taken over by Israel through the occupation. But now this uh, next step of Israel is making that occupation du jour colonialism of, of the of Jordan Valley. Now, by law, by state law, this the Jordan Valley would become Israel, not just occupied, now there's state uh, state land as well. Um, and this has been going on, like we, and, and, and it's important to make that connection that this is an ongoing process of ethnic cleansing of Nekba. We say, you've heard the, the phrase Nekba before, the catastrophe, the Nekba did not happen in 1948 and stopped, the Nekba is ongoing. And especially, it's been ongoing for the for the for the Bedouin communities in the in the south of the West Bank, for the Jordan Valley, and so on and so forth. Um, and this is the latest episode. And I'm, and I'm and I need you guys to be aware of this because this is has been in the news uh, and something that we are now dealing with. The Palestinian Authority has threatened, uh, has said that it had cut uh, diplomatic relations with Israel, had stopped security coordination with Israel. And now the latest proclamation by the PA, the Palestinian government, that if Israel went, goes ahead with the annexation, uh, basically the Palestinian Authority is going to give up all control and then allow basically Israel to take over as the occupying force to take over all of the West Bank. So this is not an easy um, scenario situation right as for as Palestinians. So we need you. We need your uh, advocacy. We need your prayers. We need your work. We need your uh, you're using your assets and your knowledge and, and your power to help, uh, especially Palestinians in this case. Particularly unique for me and for many Christian Palestinians when it comes to how do we Palestinians respond to ethnic cleansing, colonization, and, and then justice that we face as Palestinians has been, at least for, for, my, for my side uh, um, as a Palestinian Christian within also an evangelical community. The Bethlehem Bible College is an evangelical college. And so our, our biggest kind of uh, target group that we have been trying to work with have been Christian Zionists. Uh, that is even conservative, evangelical, mostly American uh, Christians 
who uh, adhere to Christian Zionism. If you're aware, of, uh, briefly, Christian Zionism is this belief, broadly speaking, that there is a divine plan in the Jewish conquest of Palestine, and actually the state of Israel, the, the, the establishment of the state of Israel is a fulfillment of God's promises to the Jewish people. God has not left his people. He has been faithful to them and continues to be faithful. Therefore, what happened to the Palestinians, the ethnic cleansing, the refugees and so on are basically byproducts of the fulfillment of God's promises to the Jewish people. So, and this is where we Palestinian Christians, especially I was myself who identifies as an evangelical, where we have to respond to this. For the most part, and this also touches on the issue of Islam, uh, Islamic identity and Arab identity, for the most part, Palestinian Christians have been ignored. Uh, and, um, and the conversation has been shaped into this polar, binary, colonial kind of paradigm of the West, the Judeo-Christian tradition, the enlightened West versus the Muslim, the Arab, the Ottoman, or between brackets, the savage, right? And these, and these, uh, these formulae of, of colonialism and of oppression have been very common in the history of Western colonialism, right? You bring in the light of Christianity to the dark continent of Africa, right? We are the enlightened ones bringing light to the dark continent of Africa. Similar attitudes of enlightenment, of um, domination and power uh, have been used throughout history and they're continuing to be used. And so for, to make that story fit, Palestinian Christians have been this awkward kind of people group within that fiction colonial fiction of us versus them, of the Christian, Judeo-Christian West versus the Arab or Muslim East. Um, and so for the most part, we have been ignored as Palestinian Christians. We don't fit into that colonial narrative of us versus them. Um, so we have been ignored for the most part. Um, and sometimes, especially lately, especially when we have been, uh, many of us have been trained, many of us have gone to the West to study and got to understand that language um, from the West and especially from the US, we have now become, become targets for uh, smear campaigns, for uh, vilification of us as Palestinians, Palestinian Christians. We have been called anything from uh, theological terrorists to those who are practicing pre-Islam, this uh, amalgamation of Christianity and Islam, to anti-Semites. Like, you name it, we have been, we have been called uh, all of these names in a way to discredit what Palestinian Christians are doing. Um, and we have been trying to deal with, with this issue through different ways. Uh, some of it has been biblical, and, um, and this is what we call theology of the land, um, where, where we are coming and saying, OK, well, you are saying that the Bible says the land belongs to the, belongs to the Jewish people. You're quoting Genesis. You're quoting Ezekiel. OK, let's go to the text. Um, and this has been uh, something that we have done very well, I think, as Palestinian Christians, and I can name a few names for you, like Yohannek Netanyahu, like Mundus Haq, others who um, have dealt with theology of the land. Um, Gary Birch also in the US has written extensively on the land in the New Testament. How do we understand the biblical vision, purpose, and function of the land throughout the whole scripture, from Genesis all the way till the end, till Revelation, which is the idea of a new heaven and a new earth. And especially, how does Christ fulfill uh, uh, the promises of the Old Testament based on the belief that Christian, in Christ, um, the law has been fulfilled? So what does that mean to the land? And so Christian Zionists have been very adept at uh, cherry picking the Bible, at finding verses in Genesis that say, I give you Abraham this land and therefore making the connection, well, therefore this promise that was made to Abraham, to, his, to him and his offspring, therefore de facto it now belongs to the Jewish people. And then they would take a, a verse in Ezekiel, or pay a verse in the Psalms, and they make this argument, clearly the land continues to belong to the Jewish people. What Palestinian Christians have been doing is to, rather than have that selective cherry picking of the text, try to have a, a broader understanding of what the land, the function and the purpose of the land. First of all, it begins, let me give you a quick synopsis. Hopefully this is not gonna to be too uh, theologically or biblically dense, um, but it begins in the, in the Garden of Eden, where the land was given to Adam and Eve as a land of blessing, as a land of goodness. Uh, God said, looked at his creation and said it was very good. All that God was made was excellent. 
And then Abraham lived, and uh, I mean, Adam and Eve lived in the land with, um, together with God. And, and we see that language of community, of love, of blessing that Adam and Eve experienced in the land. Chapter 3 of Genesis, Adam and, and Eve sin, and now they are kicked out of the land. Now they have, the land has been cursed because of their disobedience, and now they are out. The biblical narrative from there, from that chapter 3 on, all the way to Jesus, has been the story of trying to regain paradise, regain that land of blessing. Abraham enters into the picture, and now God tells, tells Abraham from Iraq, come and move into the land of Canaan, a land I'm going to give you for you and for your offspring. And then in that land, you will be a blessing to all the nations. And also the land, the, the land has been given to Abraham was not a, a very specific land, what we call today Palestine, Israel. It's actually a very expansive land. In Genesis 15, it says the land I'm going to give you is from the Nile to the Euphrates. Now, the Nile is in Egypt. The Euphrates is in Iraq. In the ancient Near East, this, this space of land is what we call the ancient, uh, the ancient world or the ancient Near East from, uh, from Egypt, which is the land of the Egyptians, all the way to Babylon, the land of the Babylonians. I need the Bible saying that the land I'm giving you, Abraham, is an expansive universal land that covers the whole known world from, from Egypt all the way to Babylon. Later on, we see God gives uh, a very specific promise that the land will be to, to Abraham and to his offspring. And I'll come back to offspring, uh, to the offspring in the New Testament, how we understand this. Going from there, we see Moses coming, uh, with Moses coming and the law coming down to Moses. And we see many, uh, many commandments have been given about how to live in the land. You have to live in justice and only justice you should practice that you will live, uh, that you may live in the land. It talks about uh, the land being a land for everyone, for the alien, for the stranger to come and live and not to live as, a, as an outcast, as someone who's removed from the community, but rather to live with the community as one, following one law that applies to everyone. Going through the prophets, we see the ethnic ties, the ethnic identity of the land is open up to anyone who basically believes in the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. So you have Rahab, you have Ruth, you have different groups, people groups that join into the family of God who are not chosen to be in the family of God because of their blood, of their ethnicity, but because of their faith, right? And this is very clear, for example, in the story of Ruth. She says, I will follow you. Your God will be my God and your people will be my people. So what, how did that transition of identity, of ethnic identity, religious identity happen to Ruth? It's because of her faith. Now we see this also happening, this narrative continues in the, in the prophets, uh, where the prophets envision a new reality of restoration of goodness to the land but that land would also be a, a land of blessing to all nations. And the prophets envision a new reality where people from all corners of the earth would come and find um, blessing in that land, where lion and lamb would live together, a state of reconciliation, a state of, a state of justice. What does God require of you? Oh man, is to do justice, love mercy, and walk humbly with God. This state of affair, affairs is given to all people who would come and get to dwell in the land. Now Jesus comes as a fulfillment of all of what we have seen in the Old Testament. And then the proclamation from Jesus is, at least we see it, uh, I don't want to deal too much with this right now, I need to finish up quickly, but he says he proclaims to be given authority in heaven and in earth. The whole land is now given to Jesus himself. In the Old Testament, read in we read in Leviticus that the land, God says, the land belongs to me. You are tenants. You are aliens in the land that belongs to the Lord. Christ in the New Testament comes and say, well, hey, you know what? Actually, the authority of that land, ownership of that land belongs to me, myself. And then as Christians join into Jesus, into Christ, they also get the promises that were given to Abraham. So now Paul comes in Galatians 3. I hope you can read Galatians 3. And this is where we find a lot of our theology. And, and, there, it, um, and there Paul makes a, a very a very confusing and startling kind of pronouncement that the offspring of Abraham, which was historically understood to refer to the Jewish people, Isaac and Jacob and the tribes, is actually Christ himself. Christ becomes the offspring. There's only one offspring, singular, not plural, and that offspring is Jesus himself. And so Christ is a fulfillment um, of the promise that was given um, to 
to Abraham, and not to a specific Jewish people. The conversation continues on Romans as well, where he says that Father Abraham is a father of faith, and those who are in Abraham are uh, heirs according to the promise that was given. We see this in Galatians, we see this heavily in Romans um, uh, as well. So this is how we have been trying to um, break up this weaponization of the text, where the Bible has been used as a tool to justify ethnic superiority and ethnic uh, uh, ethnic domination of the Jewish people uh, at the expense of Palestinians, we are trying to see that the text is actually a text of liberation and of goodness and of blessing for everyone. And so in Galatians 3, when Paul ends the chapter, he says, now there's no difference between Jew and Gentile, uh, woman and, and man and woman, or male and female, free or slave, slave all are one in Christ Jesus. This universal message um, that Paul is pro proclaiming here is the message that we try as Palestinian Christians adopt here, that the land is not given as a property that belongs to one ethnic group, group versus the other, but actually as a land of blessing for everyone who enters into the land. And especially now in this age, especially with what's happening in the US and the demonstrations and this kind of call for ethnic reconciliation, for racial reconciliation, for racial justice, for uh, dismantling of race, race, racial and racist uh, systems of power and domination, uh, we are still dealing with this, right? Like we are still dealing with a people group that says that we are better than you and we are more sovereign than you. We deserve sovereignty and, and you do not de deserve sovereignty. So this has been our struggle and it's been a hard struggle for us to deal with, uh, especially because we're not dealing with uh, people that we don't know. These are the people that we speak their language. These are who we call brothers and sisters to us in the faith. Um, and also these are Jews. Um, and the Jewish tradition is very important for me as a Christian. Um, and there's a lot of, um, it's life-giving for me. Uh, and it breaks my heart that the text has been used against me. Um, a quick note about Islam and Muslims, because this is also a theme for you, uh, for you all. When I talk about oppression and I talk about persecution as a Palestinian Christian, um, I don't get that persecution from Muslims. Actually, I and my Muslim neighbor, my Muslim friend, my Muslim colleague face the same persecution from one source, which is the Israeli occupation. In fact, I would say that occupation is maintained and supported and funded by mostly Christians. So in this awkward kind of place that I, as a Palestinian Christian, I face persecution and pain and suffering from Christians and from Jews and not from Muslims. And in fact, I and Muslim, we and Muslims are together in the same ditch as we can say. Uh, so there's anyway, there's a lot to unpack there. I think I should stop here, but I, I would love to uh, kind of carry on the conversation later on. So thank you for, for the time and uh, for the opportunity to share with you here. Uh, Thank you so much, Daniel. You've gone very deep into sort of the biblical and theological um, background of how the faith has been part of the oppression of your people. And ironically, um, you as a Christian are oppressed by Christians around the world who take on that kind of biblical narrative and interpretation. Um, we know also that Christianity has been used as part of colonization, imperialism around the world. And uh, Rabab, uh, eloquently spoke to that by us having a moment of silence for the Ohlone people uh, in the indigenous land because we know that the Bible has been used to uh, colonize native lands and has been part of uh, the justification for slavery as well as the, the attacks against LGBTQ persons. And I think that's where as we unravel this uh, understanding of that for those who are Christians, the, it behooves us to understand how do you get deeper into the faith so that you can articulate the liberation theology and perspectives that uh, people hold in their practice as well. Um, I'm going to go next to uh, Kira Sali Azam, who in a very practical way holds some of these pieces together as a Filipina and Palestinian, uh, very active in both issues in the Philippines and Palestine as well, from more of a maybe on the ground level and in organizing and in a solidarity building. Kira? Hello, good afternoon, everyone. Um, so, yes, so my name is Kira Salde Azam. Um, I am third generation Filipino American. My mother's family immigrated to the US in the 50s um, by way of Hawaii. 
Uh, they were poor farmers in the Philippines and were recruited by um, CNH sugar companies who work in the fields in Hawaii. Um, I'm also a third generation Palestinian American here. Um, and my father's family originally um, is from Bethlehem, from what I was told. And he, my grandfather, uh, fled Palestine after the great catastrophe, or Nakba, in 1948. Um, but when I visited there in 2010, I was assured actually that my family is not from Bethlehem, um, likely from Ramallah, judging from my last name. Um, but this is still a journey that I am on, um, and this is a journey that I'm on with family to understand that history. And while it's taken some detours, I feel um, that my commitment to social justice is part of that living history. Um, so. I'd like to also start by saying that as an organizer, um, that where I am today has vastly changed over the past two years. As Pastor Michael said, um, or as it was shared um, in my bio, I'm representing two different organizations, the California Nevada Philippine Solidarity Task Force and the Na National Ecumenical and Interfaith Forum for Filipino Concerns. Um, and we work closely with many organizations in the Bay Area and the Philippine Solidarity Task Force partnered with the National Council of Churches in the Philippines. So the work that's being done here in the Bay Area is aligned with other human rights organizations, both addressing issues of Filipino community um, here in the Bay, but also expressing our solidarity through education and actions and other community-based organizing. Um, including work with Iraq or the Arab Resources and Organizing Center, ASADA, the Alliance of South Asians Taking Action and other organizations, um, particularly through third world resistance. Um, so, so to go back a little bit, the few years ago when I had my daughter, my relationship to showing up radically changed. Um, and my mom, a friend, put it best by saying that we went from being on the front lines of actions to being on the front lines of bedtime and maybe getting to watch the actions on live stream. Um, so what that has forced me to do, uh, especially in recent weeks, is to realign and to work to see what my role then is and what my contribution is. And what I'm starting to understand as a parent is that I have to show up for my child so that we can and so that she can show up for her community. Um, she's already beginning to see violence in our culture through kids movies and TV programs. Um, even when we try to shield her from these kinds of things, she's inevitably exposed to kids fighting, um, monsters trying to kill each other, even Chicken Little movies featuring alien invasions uh, that have battle scenes with lasers shooting animals in the streets. Um, she is also seeing her parents emotional or upset when reading about killings or seeing um, uh, news of killings of people here in the US and in other countries. Uh, she sees us upset when we're talking with family or friends about harassment, housing issues, folks being detained. Uh, all of these things are so real for her and so real for our family, and so real for our community. And she sees her aunties and uncles going to rallies and marches. She hears her communities uh, chanting and demanding for justice. She sees us in meetings all the time. Um, and so we're trying to be responsible and talk to her about what we're seeing, what we're hearing, what is happening. And uh, my partner and I see it as our responsibility to really challenge that dominant narrative, that racist, classist narrative that our kids and our families are exposed to every day uh, through media, friends, school, other family members. Um, and what that looks like in our house now uh, is that we have talked to her about how there are, there have been a lot of people whose bodies have been hurt, uh, killed even by the police and armies. And she doesn't quite know what that means, but we light candles and we say prayers for our community, uh, specifically naming the lives that are lost 
their families, um, peace in the world. Um, and so for me, um, I'm really trying to raise her in a faith that is compassionate, but also engaging. And uh, truthfully, I've struggled with my own faith uh, growing up in the United Methodist Church. Um, and I have, but I have also found that organizing with other people in faith has given me uh, grounding in this work that feels more holistic in, in approach. Uh, so what I mean by that is that there's a particular attention to spirit and faith that has been a source of strength in very difficult times. Um, and like I had mentioned before, um, through our partnership with the National Council of Churches in the Philippines, our task force has been able to, to host annual pastoral and solidarity visits to the Philippines to really see the conditions and bear witness to the people's struggles and also to the strength of the people's resistance. Um, NCCP or the National Council of Churches is an ecumenical institution of different denominations in the Philippines that provides churches opportunities for witness and service in responding to people's issues um, and really holding the integrity of creation. So it finds its theological basis in oikomene, which is the, uh, where the word ecumenical is derived from. Um, and in the Protestant understanding of this, it, it encompasses all Christian religions. Um, but in the true definition of oikomene, it is the entire inhabited world. And this really is a call for us to work for the rights and dignity of all and to see that um, our understanding of God is to be in solidarity with us and especially those who suffer and the most vulnerable. Um, so when we started doing those trips in, to the Philippines in 2006 in response to the international call to church people, um, uh, we went to see what was happening in their in this country. And what was really upsetting for me was having visited both the Philippines and Palestine uh, was learning about the ways in which both of these countries have been ravaged by US imperialism. And the conditions in either place have been documented in human rights hearings as atrocious human rights violations, according to international law even. And it's just, um, it's so painful to hear mothers talk about their children being taken into custody or worse being killed by authorities who have been given orders to do so. Um, it's heartbreaking to hear loved ones talk about those who are student activists or journalists or environmentalists, lawyers, priests, uh, leaders who have disappeared or have been killed in broad daylight. People are exploited for profit sent to work overseas to support their families back home. People are forced to leave their homes, moving abroad when possible to seek better life. They are not free to go where they need to go, school, work, hospital, um, these basic things. And these are all US backed, US funded, actual US made weapons that are killing our people. Um, and they are sharing intel and sharing weapons and sharing tactics. They're exploiting natural resources for their profits. Then they're stealing land in the process. They are policing and surveilling just as they have done, just as the US has been founded on. Um, and these are just, you know, stories that I heard in, Phil in the Philippines and Palestine, but this is a global system that values money over people's lives. Um, and I remember coming back um, home the first time and talking to my pastor, Pastor Michael, about um, how angry and how sad I was, you know, and he reminded me, and um, this is also part of like why it feels so grounding to, to be um, in this work through church, is that we are not just experiencing and witnessing the struggles, and we're not just connected by those struggles, but we are also connected in liberation and that resilience and resistance. Um, and as we continue, as the task force continues to be in partnership with NCCP, I think it's also important to note that the advocacy work that we do um, legislative or through various campaigns is always informed and taken direction by from our partners who are on the ground and working with the people every day. Um, 
I wanted to talk about a particular bill, but I don't think that there's enough time. Um, but um, basically, go ahead. Uh -huh. go ahead. Yeah. Oh, go ahead. Yeah. Okay. Okay. I'll try to be quick. <laughs> um, so one of the most recent campaigns is calling for an end to uh, the anti-terror bill, which is an amendment to a previous act that took effect in 2007 as a way to punish people who are supposedly involved in terrorist activity. Um, so this act says that it is securing the state and protecting the people from terrorism, but it also broadly defines who a terrorist is and what it means to incite a terrorist act. Um, this is uh, an act in the Philippines. Uh, so what is the true intention behind this anti-terror bill? Uh, well, it broadens the scope of de definition and loosely defines terrorism as a participation in speeches, in emblems, participation in rallies. Um, and as we've already seen under this current administration, that there is a lot of red tagging that has been done to activists and human rights defenders. And this is um, especially dangerous because it criminalizes political dissent against the, the Duterte administration and in that danger also gives executive power uh, to police and surveil, violating democracy and due process. Um, so also through this bill, state forces will not be held responsible for any incorrect conduct and um, persons can be held for up to 14 days for charges of terrorism. Um, it has been, it has often been the practice of detainment to produce or invent evidence and trumped up charges. Uh, the Philippine military has had a long history of fabricating evidence, unlawfully detaining and trumping up charges against human rights advocates or anyone critical of the government. Um, and also the implications for Filipino Americans or any Filipinos living in diaspora are that this is possibly dangerous for them as well. In the Senate bill, they lay out language that states that they're interested in enforcing some of these laws outside of the jurisdiction of the Philippines, uh, which means people living in diaspora. Um, so they're, so they have, in 2018, there actually was, um, um, the Philippine National Police actually set up uh, office in the consulate here in, uh, or in, the, in San Francisco. Um, and their goal was, to create international relations with police agencies under the guise of creating a more robust participation of Filipinos in the US. Um, and what we've seen as advocates for human rights in the Philippines is that there's been an increase of red tagging and blinding of legitimate um, human rights organizations. So in this period of mass uprising against racist police terror in the US and around the world, the Trump administration simultaneously pursues arms deals with other countries including the Duterte regime in the Philippines. And in the same breath, it militarizes the police and deploys National Guard to dominate uh, protesters in battle zones, all in the time of the biggest economic crisis the American people have ever confronted. Um, so while fighting the imminent passage of Duterte's anti-terror bill in the Philippines, we draw on the connections between the US-backed counterinsurgency of Duterte with the police brutality in all forms of state violence in the U.S. that target and destroy Black, Brown, and immigrant and all working class lives. Um, so in closing, I just want to say that I uh, really appreciate your time and willingness uh, to hear um, this new mama speak. I am certainly still learning and growing. And honestly, I had to do a lot of research to speak today. Um, as I said before, my relationship to movement work has radically changed. And as I prepared for today, I, I really had to like be creative with time. I worked mostly with my daughter on my lap. Um, but I know that um, I'm raising a fierce ally. And I'm quickly learning that my child has everything to teach me and that parenting is such a deep portal to self-growth and that this is teaching me to be an ally um, and showing up as well. And I know that organizing begins at home. Um, so yeah, thank you very much. Thank you, Kira. Thank you so much. Very inspiring. And, uh, you know, Kira really embodies um, in her personhood 
uh, the solidarity uh, with Philippines and Palestine. And then the work that she's done also comes home to the Bay Area where uh, she resides with her partner, Nikki. And so their work continues in terms of solidarity building among organizations that are in the Bay Area here. And so we can kind of see that connection we're already making from Bethlehem, Palestine, to Philippines and to the Bay Area. I want to continue on with the theme of the expanding understanding of solidarity as I introduce our next guest, uh, Gayla King, who's a, been a longtime Philippine activist, but has more recently uh, turned and pivoted to work with immigrant populations in the U.S. and is the regional coordinator uh, for the Interfaith Movement for Human Integrity doing that work. Welcome, Gayla. Thank you, Michael, and thank you, everyone. I have to say I'm incredibly intimidated to be on this panel of rock star speakers. Kira has been such an incredible inspiration for me since I found myself at Buena Vista 13 years ago. Um, so it's just, it's a pleasure to be here. So my name is Gayla King. Um, I, before being a part of Interfaith Movement for Human Integrity, I found myself in Buena Vista, like I mentioned 13 years ago, um, at a time when my partner and I were thinking about having children and wanting a spiritual community in which to raise them. So many people had recommended we check out this small Japanese American congregation tucked away in Alameda. I don't know if we actually had been to Alameda before going to Buena Vista. And so we stumbled there one Sunday morning and we haven't left. Um, prior to that, I just wanna share a bit about my, my own journey of, of faith and identity. I'm Filipina American. My mother immigrated from the central region um, of the Philippines from Cebu to Minnesota. Um, talk about two extreme places in the 60s. And she landed there soon after they had just passed an anti-miscegenation law um, allowing um, you know, folks of different races to marry. She met my father, who was a fifth generation white settler in Minnesota, um, Dakota land, and they fell in love. And I was blessed to be raised in that biracial home where I learned about compassion and I learned about pride, cultural pride, um, and I learned about empathy, but I didn't learn about a formal spiritual um, religion of any kind. My, my parents didn't raise me in that environment. Um, they taught our values through community work and organizing. Um, so I really didn't find myself craving a space to identify myself with any um, form of religion or spirituality until later in life when I found Buena Vista. Um, and so coming upon my, my own Christian identity in the community of Buena Vista, I think um, has really shaped my ideas around interfaith solidarity and intersectional solidarity because it is so central to the ministries there. When I arrived at Buena Vista, they were just launching the partnership with Wadi Fakin. Um, and I quickly learned about, um, about what interfaith and intersectional solidarity could look like on a very kind of intimate level of the types of relationships that were being built between members of Buena Vista and community members in Wadi Fakin, such that um, I believe that I thought that's what it meant to be a Christian, is that you have these deep relationships with people who may not be your same religion or ethnicity. Um, and I have not had the privilege or the blessing to go to Palestine. It's been on my list of to-dos, um, but I've, I've had the pleasure of getting to meet Fami when he was in the Bay Area, getting to host Atta, Fami's brother, um, so getting to meet folks from Wadi Fakim throughout the years, that has been deeply impactful for me and my family. Um, so many of you are very familiar with the legacy of Buena Vista, the Japanese American legacy, um, and the, the learning about the ways in which that faith community um, not only survived the horrors of incarceration um, during World War II, um, 
but the resilience and the cultural identity that is so still strong in the faith community as we continue to expand in our own um, pan-Asian multi-ethnic identity. Um, the importance of still holding on to the Japanese American legacy, I think has been really important. Um, so through my own um, deepening in the justice making at Buena Vista, I had the opportunity to get to know another organization, which I work for now, Interfaith Movement for Human Integrity. Buena Vista began a partnership with that organization a few years ago when we felt called to deepen our immigration ministry. Um, this was at a time when there was an increase in unaccompanied minors arriving at our southern border there was a call out for folks to step up in our um, to step up as sanctuary congregations. There's a national movement of called the Sanctuary Movement. Buena Vista responded to that call, um, and through various um, processes of discernment, um, prayer, um, discussions, we we responded by saying we want to be a sanctuary congregation. So we joined that movement in 2017. Um, we're still, as far as I know, the only Japanese American congregation that is declaring themselves sanctuary. Um, and through that identity, through that calling, we've responded in the ways that interfaith movement is supporting congregations to do that. So with interfaith movement now, I'm their regional organizer for Northern California. I engage faith communities all over the Bay Area um, in embodying sanctuary. And so that means providing accompaniment to folks who are, um, are settling here, who are fighting their deportation, who are coming out of detention. That means providing public witness um, and advocating for more humane policies and practices. Sanctuary looks like showing up, holding a vigil, holding an interfaith ritual or ceremony at spaces that need healing. Um, We've held a, a vigil in front of the West County Detention Center for seven years in Contra Costa County. Um, and that resulted in, with the work of many other organizations, the um, closing of that contract. So that ICE Detention Center is no longer there. We've since moved to be organizing ourselves in front of the ICE building in San Francisco. Um, of course, since COVID hit, we're, all, we're now virtual, but we plan to be back. Um, our organization, while in Northern California has, has primarily looked at immigrant justice, we are really trying to deepen our intersectional work. In LA, our work really focuses more on mass incarceration. So we're looking and, and trying to deepen our relationships and our partnerships with the intersection of um, immigrant justice and mass incarceration. Um, and so that's looking like, how do we, um, look at our systems in and how they're connected. So how is our immigration detention system a part of the, the broader mass incarceration system that's been in this country, um, locking up brown and black communities. Um, and we've also had the, you know, the privilege of developing relationships to even expand further to look at the impacts of the US empire and other countries, um, including Palestine, including Central America, Honduras, I want to share a, a story of um, a time it, it was really brought home to me. I attended a faith interfaith delegation to Honduras last March that our organization held in partnership with um, Cher El Salvador, our Sisters of Mercy. And we were hosted by a Honduran community organization there that's been fighting and struggling to stay in Honduras. Um, and so we were there to understand more of the root causes. Why were people fleeing? And it was pretty, um, you know, we learned right away about the role that the US has in Honduras for decades, right? Economically, politically, um, militarily. So there was one meeting, one of the things that the organization on the ground wanted to leverage our global, our US presence was to get meetings with local officials, things that some of them had not been able to get for themselves being from that community. So they organized a meeting for us to meet with a local governor in this town. And um, 
right off the bat, what was hanging behind him was an Israeli flag. And so we had a Jewish leader that was in our group and we were just struck by that. Um, and so we tried to press him on the significance and he just said, well, that's, that's just the people of God. Um, the next day we met with other community organizations that were just talking about the military oppression they were experiencing and they brought out a big bag of, um, of tear gas containers and boldly on these containers, you know, had this address from Pennsylvania. Um, so just these, you know, bold um, reminders and almost proudly showing the ways in which the U.S. and Israel are supporting the occupation in Honduras um, is something that we know is important when we think about how immigrants are impacted today of why people are fleeing um, and how it's important to connect our stories and to connect our, our struggles. Um, so I think I'll, I'll pause there. I have some call to action, but maybe I'll wait, Pastor Michael, for, for yeah. later on. Can sure. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Gail. Thanks so much. So we've taken a quick journey from the West Bank to the Philippines to border issues at the uh, southern border of the U.S. and now a glimpse into Honduras. And uh, our next speaker will uh, provide us with some perspective from the country she hailed from in Haiti uh, and uh, where she was born and then uh, escaped the Duvalier regime to come to the United States as a young child. And she is, I'm so excited to introduce her here to this group because she's going to be the new pastor of Buena Vista United Methodist Church, having served at San Leandro Methodist Church for the last 15 years, will be appointed this coming week. So please welcome Reverend Myrna Bernadette Huey. Thank you, Michael. Uh, thank you for inviting me to participate in this conversation. I kind of feel a little bit like uh, Gail's comment of being in a company of rock stars here. So um, it is my honor. It is my honor to be with you. And also, Michael had said about eight to 10 minutes. And I took that to heart. So my comments will uh, may be much briefer than um, they might have been. Um, as Michael said, I uh, was born in Haiti. Uh, my family uh, was a blended family of Catholics and Methodists, my father being the Catholic, my mother being the Methodist, and uh, I was raised as a Methodist in Haiti, which was which meant being part of a tiny community in a larger sea of Roman Catholicism, which was the official uh, religion of the country. Um, and the Methodist Church in Haiti was the first uh, Protestant uh, denomination invited in to Haiti to, um, to uh, form a congregation. My family, uh, as Michael said, emigrated to the U.S. to escape the Duvalier regime in, in 1965, which was significant in terms of the date because it was shortly after the Civil Rights Act was passed, and which meant that racism was technically against the law by then. Um, and obviously it isn't, and it wasn't, but it was supposed to be, be legally so, which meant that my family didn't get to experience um, things like being told to go sit in the back of the bus, and um, lunch counters were supposed to be open, but that didn't mean that we didn't experience um, racism when we came. Interestingly enough, the fact that we were not American Blacks meant that American whites sometimes had to, felt they had to be on better behavior when they related to us, which um, later in life I found very strange, but so be it. We left Haiti after several of my father's siblings were imprisoned under suspicion of plotting against the government, which was the stated accusation that landed tens of thousands of Haitians in prison or worse under uh, the dictatorship that started the year I was born and lasted for uh, nearly 30 years. So I learned early on about the abuse of power and how a government can terrorize its citizens into silence and how violence is a common offspring of violence. Given Haiti's history as the first Black Republic in the Western Hemisphere, having fought the French and won its independence in 1804, 
which the U.S. saw immediately as an act that might put dangerous thoughts in the minds of enslaved Blacks here who might be inspired by this brazen act of self-determination. I learned early on that the U.S. has always been threatened by or, or done what it could to manipulate Black people in power. This has been its history with Haiti. The long view of Haiti's history gives me my heart, my heart for justice, and I think it's in my DNA. Dinner conversations when I was a child, um, even as young as seven, weren't conversations about how was your day, but about what's the latest news back home, or who was arrested, or is there any progress in bringing the dictatorship to an end? Letters that we would receive and our responses to them were written in code because we knew that Haitian authorities opened and read mail with possibly deadly consequences. So this was, this was the soup in which I grew up and it was a normal soup for me. One of my earliest memories though, as a very young child, while I was still in Haiti, that is to say that I was, was before I was seven years old, I remember hearing about the United Nations and feeling the fundamental truth of its founding principle of cooperation across national lines to promote world peace. Now, I think that every child on some level knows that something about this is right. Sadly, I don't know how it happened, but the United Nations, at least in its presence in Haiti, morphed into um, a terrorizing occupying force, which I witnessed firsthand after the great earthquake in 2010. I remember um, seeing these um, people with their blue hats and their dark reflective sunglasses carrying green guns and walking among the population and one point uh, asking someone, um, who are you more afraid of, the, the Haitian police or, or the United Nations? And without skipping a beat, the person I asked said, the UN, without a doubt. So that was very discouraging. And again, I don't know how quite that morphing happened, but uh, that's another discussion for another time perhaps. In any case, from an early age, something in me believed in cooperation across, across boundaries. And um, like justice, uh, I think it was in my DNA. And underlying these two principles of justice and cooperation across national lines was my faith. It was, in fact, my faith that solidified these principles in the core of my being. In my mind, God said they were right. And I don't, I don't know when this belief happened. It, it just was. More recently, I've come to appreciate the importance of living these principles, as my colleague, Reverend Brian Adkins once put it, not just in the name of Jesus, but in the way of Jesus whom I see is always calling us to greater love, greater awareness of those on the short end of society's stick, and, and greater courage to speak the truth to power. I believe my DNA of justice, intentional cooperation across boundaries, and my faith make me a person of intersections in my work, in my life, and in my ministry. They've been integral to any justice-based ecumenical efforts that I've been a part of. Michael asked me to talk a little bit about some work I did in the early 1990s uh, in Oregon through the Ecumenical Ministries of Oregon. During those years, neo-Nazi neo skinheads had become very active in the city and suburbs of Portland. And um, I want to add and say here that uh, of all the places I had lived in the U.S., uh, Oregon was the most racially hostile place um, in which I had lived, even more so uh, than the city of Boston where I was in seminary. In fact, I brought the covenant of justice, equity, and harmony to the much-needed response in Portland to the skinheads' hatred and terror. The covenant came from my time um, 
during those seminary years, shortly after the shooting death, the killing of a black football player after a Friday night football game in South Boston, which was a place of profound racism at the time. And I think still is to this day, those strains are there. The ecumenical community of Boston had come up with the covenant of justice, equity, and harmony with an accompanying symbol of a green twig, the color of life, on a red background, the color of our common blood, with five leaves, each of a different color, red, yellow, black, white, and brown. The covenant, or simply its symbol, were posted in public places, and people who believed in it were encouraged to wear um, the little red pin. And I have to tell you that I did, um, that, that I did find it comforting, and it did become for me a symbol of uh, seeing a safe person when I lived in Boston, which was a very racially tense city when I lived there. In Oregon, we personalized the Boston statement and redesigned the pin into a circular branch. And this was suggested by the Native American, the tribal member of the ecumenical group, given the belief in that culture of the power of the circle as a symbol of unity. And uh, in Oregon, tribal folks have a very active presence. Now, most recently in San Leandro, in the aftermath of the police killing of Stephen Taylor, I learned that these principles that I take for granted, uh, like the air that I breathe, that they aren't shared by all people of faith or all clergy. Um, and I confess my naivete and my idealism in thinking that, you know, send out an invitation to call a call to action to 30-some uh, colleagues, and of course, everyone will show up, and turned out to be a small group of about eight or ten of us. Many clergy, I found, are reluctant to become politically active um, and don't want to have much to do with actions that confront injustice. I couldn't understand this, especially in light of Stephen Taylor's killing, but I also accepted that I didn't have to. I didn't have to understand it. What I must do, what I must do, what I must try to be faithful to is that constant, sometimes annoyingly constant nudge of the Holy Spirit to stand up for and to stand with those today with whom I believe that Jesus would also stand or would challenge us to stand. It's that simple in many ways, and it is that hard. The pushback and resistance to this basic idea of justice for all can be, as we have seen, stupefyingly strong. We see it today in the Black Lives Matter movement, and we can see it, and I can see it for the people of Palestine. The resistance to justice for all is strong. But again, I don't have to understand it. My call is to be faithful to that principle. And so just to recap a bit, um, I am a black woman from what is commonly referred to and incorrectly since that unfortunate honor is now El Salvador's as the poorest country in the Western Hemisphere, who emigrated as a child to the richest country in the world. I am a Haitian American United Methodist, whose partner is a Chinese American native San Franciscan Presbyterian. I am a black clergywoman who has always been the first Wherever I have served, wherever I've been appointed to serve in our system, we are sent. I was the first woman on a staff at a historically black church in Philadelphia. I was the first non-white person to serve in Oregon. I was the first woman at a predominantly black church in North Oakland. I was the first black pastor of my congregation in San Leandro. And now the same at Buena Vista, starting next week, 
the first black pastor and the first woman is senior pastor, although that congregation, and I have to say your congregation, as I look around the screen and I see people whose names I already recognize, uh, has a history of supporting women in leadership and sending candidates forth. I don't know, I don't know why God has called me to stand at these places of major intersections. But there they are, and there I am. But what can happen at an intersection is that we can see many sides and we can see many roads as we stand there. And the intersection can be an uncomfortable place to stand, and that's what I have found. But when I think of this, I remember the story of the healing pool of Bethsaida. I think it's from the fifth chapter of John. It was that pool that healed only when an, an angel touched the water and the water became troubled. So it's interesting to me that healing came in the midst of troubled waters. And so to those who are uh, students in this class, perhaps, or others who are, are maybe feeling your own discomfort at standing in the intersections of your life, I, I would, let me apologize for that loud sound. There is a tree being cut in my yard, even as I speak. Um, but I encourage, um, encourage us to look for the intersections that are that are uniquely yours um, and to stand in those places to bring the greater compassion and understanding um, that your perspective in that intersection has given to you and uh, the greater compassion and understanding um, that our world uh, needs at this time from your own God-given gifts. Thank you. Thank you, Myrna. Beautiful and inspiring words. And uh, I know Buena Vista folks are so excited to have you come on board at Buena Vista this coming week. And I know where Bob is going to really be um, overjoyed to, to get to know you and form that relationship as well. Our last speaker um, kind of loops back to the beginning where Daniel Bonura shared a Christian perspective from Bethlehem, and all of our speakers have been coming from the Christian faith. Our final speaker comes from the Muslim faith, because the partnership that uh, Buena Vista began and that morphed into what's called Friends of Wadi Fukin is a partnership that was started with the United Methodists uh, with a Muslim village uh, of Wadi Fukin in the West Bank. Um, Fami Manasra was initially the a person who um, helped form that partnership. And uh, he's uh, uh, with us today after going back to Canada where he lives, he's part of the Palestinian diaspora. And so we wanna turn it over to Fami for our last comments. Fami, you're muted. Can you hear me? Good. I'm okay. Thank you. Sorry for that. Uh, um, it's uh, my sincere uh, pleasure to be with you guys. Uh, thank you very much for giving me this opportunity. Uh, and uh, always back to the starting point, uh, what you can. Uh, to be honest, uh, me myself, uh, I was deeply inspired by uh, Reverend uh, Michael. I learned much from him. I'm sure also many people who are listening or attending uh, this uh, session, uh, they have the same feeling that have been inspired by this great man. Uh, anyway, my name is Fahmi Manasra, coming from uh, Bethlehem, from uh, a small village, a farming community to the southwest of uh, Bethlehem. I work as uh, a tour guide and uh, 
being working as a tour guide uh, brought me to a unique opportunities to understand the land, my own land that I am uh, bringing people to and I'm explaining about it. But uh, such a career had uh, widened my knowledge about the value of the land. How come people from all over the world coming to my own country? What for? And of course, the main thing that uh, drives people to come is uh, coming back to find the roots of their faiths. Uh, so the faith is somehow connected to the land. And this land, uh, which I call it the cradle of all faiths, Christianity, Judaism, and Islam. Uh, therefore, I am so optimistic to refer to my land as it's unifying different faiths, not diversing them, not causing them to come to have a, a kind of conflict or fight. But I am, I am saying that it is uh, unifying people in one piece of land. And from, from that piece of land, uh, the message of peace has been spread all over the world. I, I can't proceed without uh, giving you uh, little information about my own community, the village of Wadifukin. Many of you have been there. Uh, this small village, always I refer to it as an icon to the ongoing conflict uh, in Palestine that started in the last century. Uh, the people of Wadifukin definitely, they had their own portion of, the, of suffering uh, that uh, concluded from the conflict. Uh, this farming community, the land of which had been shrinking uh, year after the other uh, due to the conflict and to the confiscating of the land. However, the land that remained with us, which we uh, precious so much, is the only thing that we have. And uh, this won't end our suffering because recent days with the implementation of uh, what is called the Trump Initiative deal of the century, we are still having a very serious challenge. I mean, it's the most uh, dangerous among the, even uh, more than previous days because it's going to consume what is remained from our land. Uh, uh, everybody is worried and anxious. We don't know what is the final outcome of uh, implementing uh, this initiative or this plan. Uh, but of course, uh, the worst is expected to be coming. And uh, if it's uh, actually coming to uh, affect, it is going to consume northern parts of the village. And there, they are going to initiate a kind of industrial zone. And the part of the land will be annexed completely to Israel. Uh, are they going to annex only the land without people or land with people? We don't know. We are still worried and waiting the coming days to bring uh, the secrets of uh, this initiative. Uh, of course, uh, also my work as a tour guide, bringing me to meet with different people from diverse uh, faiths uh, as a Muslim. I have seen that uh, my own religion is linked with other faiths and religions. And usually it's a kind of completing each other uh, and coexisting. I haven't seen any conflict uh, between different religions. On the other hand, uh, actually I have seen that uh, we can smooth all the, our understanding in, in our own faiths to have uh, to achieve a common uh, uh, universal goal with its peace for all mankind. And also it was uh, a privilege for me to um, start a kind of initiative in my own community, Wadifukin, to bring people from West, mainly from Europe, as well as from the United States of America to come and have a kind of uh, homestay with Muslim families. The reason for making this, I wanted to eliminate the misunderstanding from my own people towards the Western people. As we know, people have been deeply affected from the last century conflict, from the colonization coming from Europe and from the West in general. 
So people usually would uh, evaluate any person, people, he is part of that evil colonization. So they don't know that people, uh, they have nice people, they are normal, natural people who really care for peace and justice. So when they, those people come to have a kind of homestay with the families in Wadifukin and uh, uh, socializing with them, talking, the people were impressed. How come this person coming from America, he has such a peaceful mentality? Really, they were shocked. I am not exaggerating. Uh, the people said, oh, there are still nice people for, uh, coming from the West, from America. They are not always, all of them uh, evil and uh, trying to fight, to fight uh, us and uh, causing more suffering to us. But, uh, uh, and the, this uh, practice actually uh, meeting people and uh, welcoming them to Watafukin had brought me to that unique opportunity to meet with uh, Reverend Michael and other members from the United Methodist Church. And from there, we were talking and uh, it was uh, the spark of a great uh, partnership between Watifukin and Alameda and the United Methodist Church. And uh, the outcome of that great partnership had been uh, uh, so useful to my community in particular in, in Wadi Fukin, uh, people uh, benefited much from this partnership. Besides, uh, it uh, enlightened the people about uh, the Good Samaritan. I mean, I will call it, who are coming from the West and trying to help uh, another faith as a Muslim community. The people were impressed how Christians are coming here and they care for us. And uh, definitely this uh, contributed so much in uh, bringing a, a better understanding between different faiths. Uh, so this is in brief, uh, I'm just uh, uh, trying to fit in my introduction. Uh, I knew that I had a limited time, so that's why I only prepared a little portion, but I'm glad to answer questions about the thing that I have noticed that all uh, speakers, they represent Western part of the equation. I am the one who is representing the Eastern part from uh, people who benefited from this uh, partnership from Wadi Fukin. Thank you very much. Okay. Thank you, Fami. Um, I know that it's been a challenge for you. People may not know, but Fami was uh, had moved to Canada with his family several years ago, but he was stuck in the West Bank because of uh, the COVID-19 situation and lack of flights out. His brother, his twin brother, who is uh, our key contact now in the partnership, has been stuck in Indonesia. And I believe he hasn't been able to leave yet, right, Fami? That's right, yeah, he's still there. Yeah. Yeah. He's still he's waiting still. for a flight from Indonesia back mm -hmm. home to the village of Wadi Fakin. I want to thank all of our speakers for today. It's been very rich and we want to open it up for questions. And so for students and also people from the community who would like to ask a question, you can go into the chat box and write your question there and then we'll repeat it um, and direct it to the particular person you'd like to ask a question to or if it's the whole panelists as well. Um, as you're doing that, I do want to come back to um, one piece and ask uh, Pastor Myrna, uh, you made some reference to the work that you were convening with uh, the killing of Stephen Taylor. I just saw on the news last night, Stephen Taylor's grandmother and mother having a press conference. Could you share a little bit more about that work and then kind of where it's at now in terms of the resolution of his killing and what's going on with the San Leandro City Council? There are so many pieces to the answer to that question. The good news, I suppose, is that um, he hasn't been forgotten. That's probably the first thing because his killing happened on April 18th. Um, and then, um, then, of course, the horrific killing of George Floyd uh, just uh, galvanized the world. And, um, and Stephen Taylor, as his family has, has said periodically, have people forgotten? Uh, well, the community of San Leandro has not forgotten. Um, the city council two, 
two weeks ago, maybe three. I'm sorry, the days have been running into each other as I've been uh, leaving San Leandro, um, did take action to um, establish a uh, advisory committee to the city council of San Leandro on uh, race and equity in the city. So that, that was a meeting that took them till about two o'clock in the morning. Um, they approved to do that. Um, the case was then um, both the city council and the, the clergy group that uh, I was involved with um, have requested um, the Attorney General of California to take a closer look at the case. Um, if you don't know the case, uh, there is a YouTube video of, of what happened. Stephen Taylor uh, is an African-American man, about 27 or so years old, I think, and at the Walmart in San Leandro holding a bat. Um, someone called and said there was somebody who was doing threat behaving, behaving in a threatening way. And um, within two and a half minutes of the police arriving, one officer who was the last on the scene, there were two, the second on the scene within uh, less than 30 seconds of his arrival as Stephen was backing away and backing away and backing away, shot him once in the, shot, in the chest and he was killed. So that was the situation for Stephen Taylor. Um, the clergy group has also uh, asked of the city of San Leandro to establish a citizens review board of the police. Um, we, I had to pull away from the group to turn my attention to Alameda. Uh, I don't think we have a response yet to that request. Um, the city of San Leandro has a, a long historic uh, reputation. Um, I'm learning more about Alameda, but I think maybe it's not too un, un, um, dissimilar from, from Alameda's uh, being a red line district, uh, being a, a place where uh, it was clear that Black folk were not welcome. Um, it has evolved over time. The majority of the city council are people of color, um, but it has a long way to go in terms of in, in police departments in this nation around their own issues of systemic racism and how uh, that turns uh, violent so quickly. So things are in process right now, Michael. I don't know what if there's anything specific that I can uh, respond to. Well, that's very helpful. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. And I think you'll find that, um, yeah, I think you mentioned San Leandro and Alameda are very similar. I think they are and from folks that I've talked to. And so the kind of um, racism that exists there, longstanding entrenchment. And so dealing with the councils there, uh, very similar, I think, as well. You'll find that as you come to Alameda, um, similar terrain that will be there. And I think the, I think among Buena Vista, there, there are many folks who are interested in having that conversation around where does Black Lives uh, enter into the ministry at Buena Vista. I'm sure that as uh, the class here on Islamophobia and Arab Studies, the intersections also with Black Lives is a topic of conversation that Rabab will continue to have as well. Um, I want to turn back to Fami and Daniel for the moment because uh, you alluded to it, but I'm not sure if everyone fully understands the um, critical juncture that uh, Palestine is at now with the annexation plan to begin on July 1st. And if you want to just share a little bit more about that and also what people are doing uh, now preparing for that. Fami and Daniel, if you can share. Yes, yeah, I, I mean, uh, say a few things and uh, definitely my colleague Daniel can add more. Uh, this initiative uh, actually is uh, threatening uh, our existence in uh, Palestine and it's going to eliminate any dream or any hope for a uh, state for Palestinians because it's going to divide the land into separated islands. Uh, according to this plan, uh, they are going to annex more than 130 settlements from all over the West Bank. And also they are going to annex uh, at least one third of the total size of the West Bank, including uh, all the Jordan Valley and um, other settlements all over the country. And uh, such a thing is going to divide 
people more and more. Uh, and uh, they said, no, no worries. We will connect those people with uh, tunnels and bridges. But this is, of course, uh, won't work because uh, you are taking my land. You are preventing me to have my right to initiate my own land on my own soil. Uh, so the future is uh, not promising and uh, it's going to be uh, uh, having a kind of destructive impact upon the Palestinian people, their living, as well as their own future in their own land. Maybe Daniel, like to add more. Yeah, shukran. Thanks a lot. Uh, no, that that helps. That helps a great deal. Um, just to just to explain the reality, the difference between occupation and annexation. So occupation, legally speaking, is is legal. Occupying forces can exist uh, for an interim period for a, a certain purpose, and that's been the function of the Israeli state in the West Bank as an occupying force. An extension, on the other hand, is almost always illegal. Uh, we're talking about the annexation or basically an ex the, um, taking legal possession over land of a different people. In this case, of course, the Palestinians, which goes, first of all, against international law, against UN resolutions about the two-state solution, about the peaceful end to the conflict between the Palestinians and Israelis. But it's also destroy, destroying uh, any hope for any kind of semblance of justice and, and, and equality or a semblance of sovereignty for Palestinians. Uh, a lot of the land is going to be taken. And now, and now this land, while, for example, some Palestinians would have um, people in the Jordan Valley would have access to that land, with annexation, they would lose all access to that land, the land that they always held in their families. Um, for example, I can give you the example of Jericho. Jericho now is in the Jordan Valley, the, one of the biggest West Bank uh, cities for Palestinians. And now the, the city of Jericho is going to, if you've seen, if you can see the maps of the annexation, the, the city of uh, Jericho is going to be surrounded by, quote unquote, Israel. So now this is going to be a landlocked, basically, hand to stand system where, where the people of Jericho, Jer Jericho Palestinians would be trapped in on, on the city. Um, think of it um, like Swiss cheese, right? Like Israel has the cheese and Palestinians are living in the holes. Uh, this is kind of, Jericho is that one big example of the hole in the middle of the cheese of the West Bank. Uh, this kills effectively kill, kills any, any peaceful political uh, way to pursue a two-state solution with the Israelis. Uh, this has stopped, you know, 10, 15 years ago, or like 10, 12 years ago, when basically negotiations between the Palestinians and the Israelis stopped. But since then, especially with the American support, especially with the Trump administration support of uh, Netanyahu, Bibi Netanyahu, um, this basically is the end of the two-state solution and a de facto establishment of the uh, what we call greater Israel. We're not talking about two-state solution. We're not talking about the one-state solution. We're talking about a greater Israel solution where the Palestinians are left as the unwelcomed resident of Israel. Uh, so it's very alarming. Um, and um, it's very worrisome to myself who lives here in the West Bank in Bethlehem and to the rest of Palestinians here in the West Bank. So this is where we are. Um, we're not sure what it's gonna, is going to happen afterwards, uh, but it, but it seems uh, seems as if the two-state solution is, is taking its last breaths now, and it's 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 coming to its uh, fateful end. I know that here in the Bay Area, there are many calls for uh, car caravan actions, uh, particularly on on July first um, here and also across the country and around the world, for that matter. And I noticed that in the chat box, Austin Tam has posted a petition opposing uh, the annexation. Thank you, Austin, for posting that. You can see that to uh, sign your name on that petition. Um, I'm seeing in the chat box mostly uh, uh, comments of thank yous for all of our speakers today. No questions so far. I do want to uh, follow up with Gayla on uh, one aspect of your work, too. I know that in addition to your work with Interfaith Movement, you're involved in something called World Without Walls. If you can share a little bit about that. I think that would be very uh, instructive for people here today. 
So um, World Without Walls um, Bay Area Coalition, which formed a few years ago um, as a way to bring the issue of Palestine liberation um, more intersectionally with the work that was happening here in the Bay Area around immigration. So Interfaith Movement joined this coalition um, and we've had two annual events. Um, the Cal Nevada, uh, I believe, Advocacy and Justice Committee has also joined or at least endorsed our last event. Um, part of our, at least with Interfaith Movement, part of our hope it would be an opportunity to bring some of our Jewish faith partners um, to deepen their understanding of the situation of, of Palestine, of what's happening there. We work with a lot of Jewish communities when it comes to immigrant solidarity, um, but it's been more challenging and complicated when, it, when we try to bring in Palestine liberation work. So through World Without Walls Coalition, hoping different events. Last year, we held an event which was lifting, we called World Without Walls, World Without Cages, where we lifted up the impact on youth and children of the Israeli occupation in, of the, the Palestinian children, um, connected it to how youth and children are impacted by immigrant detention and how youth and children are impacted by policing in Oakland. This year, um, we're gonna hold an event in the, it, at the end of August, this, it's going to be virtual. Um, this time with Jamal Juma with Stop the Wall campaign will join us um, virtually. And we're gonna be lifting up again, just the intersectional um, work around policing, militarism and um, immigration. So we haven't quite settled on the date and time. We'll send that out. Um, I would love to share it with this class and this community and just invite, invite you all to join us. Thank you, Gela. I wanted to ask Kira a follow-up question as well, and that is, you know, given that you have um, been doing international work, but you're also involved in local organizing, what has been the biggest challenges of holding all of that together? And you've you've already alluded to being a mother right now and spoken to that, um, but particularly around the various groups that um, you're doing intersectional work with. Um, what have been some of the um, obstacles? The big, biggest challenges, yeah. The challenges. Well, I, and I know too, um, it might be helpful for, for you to share a little bit about the work you did in Mindanao. I know you lived there for a while, and so you work with Muslim communities there too. Yeah. Um, so right now, um, my, my personal challenges mostly have, have to do with time um, and capacity. Um, as I shared, uh, being a new mom um, and my partner working full time and doing full time organizing, um, it is challenging for both of us to participate um, fully. Um, in terms of my time in the Philippines, um, so I did have the privilege of working in Mindanao, as you said, um, at a place called Initiatives for Peace. Um, and this is in the Southern region of the Philippines. Um, and I stayed there for a couple of months actually um, in 2014. Um, and while I was there, I did work and serve with uh, both Christians and Muslim teachers, um, mostly documenting their experiences in rural communities. Um, and um, the harassment that they face uh, by the military in those areas. Um, and I, I think the particular connection um, that I wanted to, um, that I wanna highlight, I guess, um, is that in the Southern region of the Philippines, um, this is a very um, highly populated um, area of Muslims. Um, and it was never fully colonized by Spanish Christians when they uh, colonized the Philippines um, between 15, 65 in 1898, so many years ago. Um, but because they are so organized in their religion, they already had an army ready to defend the land. Um, but in 2001, the Philippines was actually named the second front on the war on terror because of the high population of Muslims in the Southern region. Um, and it's important to note too, that in the South, Southern region, um, this is where the Revolutionary Army of the Philippines also is based, the New People's Army. Um, so it's 
you know, it, the U.S. has continued uh, to, to not only support the Philippine army through weapons and intel sharing, uh, but also through exercises. And they have many bases all over the Philippines still. Um, and it really is. Um, and they even have um, like the um, visiting forces agreement, uh, which is uh, an agreement which takes all liability off of the U.S. for any misconduct, damage, death. Um, but it's really about their interest in preserving uh, the, their um, profit in those areas for the national natural resources. And it's also a strategic location because it directly faces China. Did that answer yeah. your question? Yeah, thank you. And I think that the piece that you spoke about in terms of the Philippines being the uh, Asian front on terrorism um, helps really helps people understand that there is a commonality to the demonization of everyone here that's spoken on this panel um, that's linked to uh, the war on terrorism. Back home here, um, I mentioned at the outset that um, the Ahmed program and Rabab Abduhadi have been targets of smear campaigns, and that's also around this um, aggression around naming or uh, stereotyping people as being part of terrorist uh, 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 representatives. And I wanted to ask Salim if you could um, share screen some of the um, photos of posters that were smearing uh, Dr. Abahadi back in 2017, probably before some of you students were on uh, campus. Salim, is that possible? This has happened in 2017, and um, smear campaigns against Rabab, against the Ahmed program. And um, this not only took place here um, at San Francisco State University, but took place as well with Hatem Baziam at UC Berkeley, who's a Palestinian professor there as well. Um, this is something that Rabab is not going to talk about herself much, but for me as an ally, it's important for me to bring this up so that people are aware of this, because many people in the Bay Area are not even aware that this has been taking place over the last several years. And this is what Rabab has has to endure, uh, not only trying to organize and teach the classes, but, but teaching classes under attack from these uh, uh, sources of uh, vitriol. And uh, I wanted to uh, turn it back to Rabab to share, as the professor of this class, um, to share some closing words from her uh, before we give uh, a last minute to each of our panelists. So can we, uh, can we get to Rabab in the speaker view? And... So, okay, can we lose, okay, yeah, yes. Hi, thank you so much. I actually was thinking about um, what do I want to say, having heard these such amazing presentations. And I keep thinking about um, talking about connections, connections of love, connections of solidarity, connections of building communities. And uh, I also kept thinking about the tradition of call and response, which is a very big tradition in the African, but also all the traditions of our communities in which people speak and then you respond. And sometimes you don't respond directly. Sometimes you just say whatever comes to your mind. And I was reminded by the poet, poem by the late Palestinian poet Tawfiq Zayad, who was the mayor of Nazareth, who was actually a Christian. And he was a communist too. So it's, uh, we have all these variations in Palestine and it's called Unadikum, I call on you. And he talks about the Palestinians who are under Israeli rule, calling the Palestinians outside in the diaspora and talking about what it means, the connection with the land. It's very, it's very powerful, uh, very strong, and it evokes a lot of emotions for people who know it. And we can actually share translation with it. So I thought this is what, this is the, the tradition I would like to follow because I was trying to say, what do I, what do I say? What do I respond? How do I speak as a teacher of these classes at the same time as a uh, activist, as somebody who's part of these communities, who's worked with many of you and are meeting new people as well, and building all these relations. So I wanted to start first by thanking Michael Yoshi. 
actually this event began because we really wanted to do an event to honor Michael. And of course, Michael being Michael, refused to let us honor him and then took the whole ceremony of honoring and made it into an educational event and said, how about this? How about this? How about this? And this basically, and it really to, speaks to the humility, speaks, speaks to the contribution, speaks to how amazing a person Michael Yoshi has been and has worked with us day in and day out. Last Saturday, I was on, on the webinar honoring Michael on the Zoom webinar with the Buena Vista. And I, it was amazing to hear all the words of people talking about the various connections. I'm not going to repeat them all. It really struck me how many people have been to Palestine, how many people have been there. And I, I mean, I know I've been coming to Buena Vista quite a lot, but I did not realize how much this is really big part and parcel. We did have a joint event. We actually hosted the mayor of Wadi Fukin a few years back at San Francisco State. It was another open classroom. And I think it actually, was actually maybe the first uh, event that Salim uh, videotaped. Volunteers came in as a graduate student and actually helped uh, volunteer. And we had it with several people from the community and so on. But also historically, we've been doing this work. Uh, and uh, the connection is Kira. Kira was one of, actually took the first class on Palestine at San Francisco State we offered in 2009. It was right after the uh, bombing of Gaza, 2008, 2009. And it was the spring of 2009. And Kira was one of the students. And one of the assignments in the class was to uh, interview uh, and speak about the community organization, interview some people and bring oral histories. It's very, very interesting how things turn around. So Kira selected to talk to Michael Yoshi. And uh, I said, okay. And so Kira presents her and then the students, various students came in and every one of them gave their presentations. It was multiple, it was very, very interesting class, very, very active. We actually had a huge Islamophobia incident right on campus. So we were dealing with it inside the classroom and outside of the classroom where uh, the college Republicans and pro-Israel supporters posted the poster of the second tenet of Islam and told, asked people to throw shoes. It's quite insulting to everybody, to you know, Muslims, but also to everybody who has any compassion whatsoever. So we were dealing with that inside and outside of the classroom, but I'm not going to go into it. But Kira brought in the discussion about Michael Yoshi, but also we built on that and we started a project called Stories of Palestinian Diasporas where we collected oral histories. And this is part of what Michael Yoshi and Buena Vista and the Japanese community actually speaks about, is collecting oral histories, telling histories in order for us to continue the struggle, to bring people concretely, these stories to people, to understand, to push forward. And in the process of collecting the stories of Palestinian diasporas, we also participated uh, with uh, the Buena Vista United Methodist Church in a big project called Building Communities. And uh, Michael had the connection with Conrad Adara, who's a filmmaker who made the film called Enemy Alien, which is on the student syllabi for, I think, this week or last week, uh, where um, my Conrad Adara, who's a Japanese-American director, interviews a Palestinian, uh, Farouk Abdel Mati, who was incarcerated after 2001 in New Jersey under the whole policing issues. And he interviews him. And in the process also, Conrad goes into his own history and talks to his own grandmother who was incarcerated during World War II. And so it brings a lot. It is not, as we always say, we never conflate histories and say everything is exactly the same. But there are so many connections to bring together. Through that, we've met people like Grace Shimizu, who is from the Readers, Japanese uh, Peruvian or History Project. And we were invited to go to Crystal City last year and to with the pilgrims who were going back. We participated in the Day of Remembrance almost every year in the Kabuki Theater. Uh, we had Palestinians speak. Palestinians come and light candles, but just being in the audience and attending. We also did the Day of Remembrance at San Francisco State in coordination with the Asian American Studies Department with our colleagues in Asian. And actually this past uh, spring, we did one of the biggest events we had in February was a ceremony in the Garden of Remembrance at San Francisco State, which has uh, rocks symbolizing the concentration camps that Japanese people were, were placed in. And we did it with several classes in Asian American studies. We participated. 
at all, by the way, on Ahmed uh, Studies um, Facebook page because you know we have no resources. The only way we do it is to stream live our events to make it the knowledge accessible. And this is part of our tradition that we are inspired by the spirit of 68, where the community and the university are work together and the education is decolonized. So to me that there's many, many other things to speak about Michael Yoshi, but I want to also um, uh, nod to what uh, we started with, with Daniel, started in Bethlehem. And it's so important to start in Bethlehem. And I was just wanted to mention a couple of points. One is that uh, when we went, you know, we, I used to go as a little kid, we used to go to Bethlehem to see the Church of Nativity, to visit and so on. But when we were growing up, we went because the Church of Nativity, as you know, it was surrounded and under siege by the Israelis. And so we went after to visit. And we, there was a young uh, tour guide who was a policeman as well. And somebody asked him from the tourists, he said, oh, this must be, this must be really old. He said, no, no, it's not really old at all. It's only 500 years. And it actually brings the concept of history, of what is old and what is not old, and puts things in perspective. Because he wasn't really joking. He was really talking about that 500 years is not, and even on the United States as well, we know that there is indigenous people who've lived here many, many generations and so on before the settler colonial project and before African people were kidnapped and placed against their will in, in, in slavery. In this country. And all the other actions that this country has done from exclusion to incarceration, to McCarthyism, to, to content pro and so on and so forth. So to me, that was really um, kind of thinking about Bethlehem, but also uh, a couple of points that Daniel brought, which are really, I think very important is to all talk about what is the role of Christians in the world today. And I, there has been a lot of distortion. And I've all, I always speak about 1492, the day on which the, 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 the settler colonial project begins in the Western Hemisphere. And it would have never been possible had Christianity not been distorted and misused and abused by the Catholic kings in Spain, who had actually just completed the inquisition and the expulsion of Jews and Muslims from the Iberian Peninsula where there was tolerance among the regions and so on. And it had nothing to do with Jesus. It had nothing to do with Christianity. It had nothing to do with the teachings of compassion and humanity. And I think this is, again, also, Michael, you spoke about the, the terrorism label and so on. And this is very convenient for the forces of, 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 uh, uh, of oppression, including the pro-Israeli forces and white supremacists and the Christian Zionists and so on. It's very convenient for them to use that because they use the, the, the discourse on Islamophobia, the discourse on the war of terror, which you spoke about Kira, about the Philippines and so on, in order for them to propagate things. So for example, in one of the attacks against us with our collaboration with Al Najah National University, one of the leading pro-Israeli uh, groups, Campus Watch, which is led by the Islamophobe, Daniel Pipes, post all the pictures of Al Najah of only boys, of only men. And Najah University has 64% of the population students, women. But it is not a convenient truth to put that out because if you put that out, it confuses the image of trying to present Arab and Muslim men as bloodthirsty terrorists, as misogynists, are exceptionally homophobic. All of these labels and so on, it doesn't really work. So there is some of the stuff is being used day in and day out. When, when you spoke, and I'm just going to kind of like not to some of the things that you've mentioned, Kira, Philippines, I'm always reminded by our work with the Gabriella Network, with multiple anti-dictatorship back, back in the 80s. I'm talking about when I was an activist before I even became an academic. I'm talking about uh, currently the League of Filipino Students at San Francisco State, which is one of the leading organizations, very active. I am talking about my colleagues who are teaching day in and day out, and people who have been very much involved historically in the struggle around Palestine, and also in exposing the connections between then Marcos, and today Duarte, and what's happening and with the, with the, with the, with the uh, I think, and, and this also takes us to the project that Jewish West for Peace has started called the Deadly Exchange, talking about the ways in which Israeli and US police and militarized forces train together and basically spread the knowledge of killing, the knowledge of assassination, the knowledge of ending people's lives, and something that actually called the Deadly Exchange and needs to be stopped. Uh, Gaila, you were talking about Central America, and I was also reminded when you mentioned Honduras, actually I had a very good friend in the 90s, during the 80s, Javier, 
he was very active in New York, and uh, I asked about him after few months he was killed. In Hindi. We were also also very active, uh, working jointly with the Committee for Insolidarity with the people of El Salvador, with people working in Nicaragua, with the indigenous people in Guatemala. And uh, in the 80s, one of the things that the Japanese community has actually done was jump to the support of Palestinians in Los Angeles when eight, seven Palestinians and a Kenyan wife of one of them were arrested under, again, the terrorism label. And that was Reagan administration's attempt to target the Palestinians because they could not undermine the Central American movement because they were involved in supporting the death squad the same way as Myrna, the way they were supporting Tuntul Makut and Papa Doc Duvalier. And uh, so they were very much involved in that. They were trying to cover this up because they were supporting the Contras in Central America. And so the, what they tried to do is target the Palestinians because they thought the Palestinians will be the weakest link. And if they are able to do that, then they can spread it to the movements in Central America and else, elsewhere and so on. But at the same time, also the whole question, I think uh, you mentioned, Gayla, the tear gas and the federal labs and actually federal labs, Palestine Solidarity Committee, with which I was in the chapter in Pittsburgh, did a very big protest against federal labs because they were producing the tear gas which is also some of it is produced today against the protesters in Minneapolis and around the, the country and the uprisings for black lives and for, for, for black liberation. So that is that there are a lot of connections there. And I think also in terms of Haiti, one of our colleagues, uh, Mamira Prosper, uh, went to Palestine with us when we did the Teaching Palestine Conference in 2018. And she spoke about the occupation by the United of the United Nations of Haiti. And she was talking about and they need to hold people accountable and the ways in which people get escape accountability when we do not hold them uh, accountable. I think also, I mean, uh, I guess uh, I would, I want to just say a couple of things about, uh, yeah, and you spoke about the prisoners and the dinner table. And um, to me, I grew up around, I grew up with that tradition. Dinner table was always who's going, who's been arrested and who's get, getting released from prison, whose home is being demolished, whose trees is being and that also goes to what, what Daniel is speaking, speaking about and what Tahmi is speaking about. And I will, I will end with that because it is, it's just, uh, to me, when you speak about Wadi Fukuyin and you speak about uh, the Israeli um, uh, continuous colonization of our land, I am always thinking, I do think about what happens in terms of political terms, but I also think about what happens in terms of the livelihood. I mean, when I see olive trees, I'm always thinking about our olives. You know, we have a few trees, not that many because the oil keeps going. And then they, my brothers send me my share. I always tell them, send me my share. And then my mother, when she was alive, used to send me za'atar. She will make za'atar herself, a mix of za'atar. And you will dip it. And when you have that, it's a taste from home. It has that feeling that connects you on a very human level. And it connects the people who have been traveling back and forth, but also connects the people who may not have traveled people who are in Buena Vista, people who are spread around the Bay Area, people who are actually able to understand what does it mean on a basic level and how are we able to actually make these connections and think what is our role as educators? Why is it that we are producing knowledge? To what ends do we do? Why do we, why do we teach what we teach? What is it that we are doing? And how can we come together in a framework of the indivisibility of justice, that we do not think that one struggle is more important than another. We do not rank oppression. We do not engage in oppression Olympics, but we actually think about our humanity, what connects us together. It's hard. It's very, very difficult. It's especially in these days, it's much harder as we see more people dropping. As we see a man for almost nine minutes is not able to breathe and being killed by another human being. And I really, honestly, I really, I, st I not understand it intellectually, but I don't understand it on a human level. I don't understand how that is possible. I don't, I mean, it's, it's impossible. And I try again and again, and I've studied this. And I think it's really important for us to hold those people who fell in our hearts, in our minds, uh, to respect their dignity, to respect their humanity. And at the same time, wake up every single day and say, we're going to continue struggling because we don't have any other choice. We have to continue struggling. We have to see our compassion with each other. So I'm going to stop here and keep it for people who may want to say something. I really, really appreciate it. I'm so thankful, Michael, for bringing us all together. I'm so grateful to this amazing community, to all of you for coming together and teaching us 
co-learning with each other and providing us the opportunity to connect with real lives and to struggle together. Thank you. Thank you much, Rabam. I do want to ask us uh, if we can, if we'll close now with a final word from each of our panelists in the same order that we went in, uh, maybe one minute each, just a final comment mm -hmm. I'd like to share as we close our time together. So. <laughs> Uh, thank you, Pastor Mikey, uh, Michael. I am very thankful for this session. I have been inspired. I've been I've learned a lot. I've been challenged by a lot of this, the speakers. So thank you for, for this time together, reflection and um, uh, analysis. Uh, I'll just finish with an encouragement to you all to uh, um, fight the good fight. Uh, we need your solidarity. We need your grit. <laughs> we need your um, radical hope. I think there's there's every reason for us not to be hopeful, to lose hope. So a radical hope is, is that conviction that things will be better one day. And then we are in the act of making that uh, new heaven and new earth come to be. So I encourage you to um, press on with that. We need you. We need you to use your resources, your, your, your privilege, uh, whatever assets you have to help those in need, especially in our case, the, the Palestinian uh, Case, but also any case that you feel, any issue of social justice, of any uh, oppression that you see around you, to be those agents of change, to be the change that you want to see. But also, I would encourage you also to couple your activism, um, your political involvement, with, all, with also contemplation. So have that balance between action and contemplation. We need your advocacy, we need your work, but also you need your own contemplation. You need a, a vibrant and healthy spiritual life. So I encourage you to hold those two intention. Uh, one should not um, uh, sacrifice the other. One should not supplant the other. But rather than we will both, um, both build each other up, having a, a sound faith and also a sound mm -hmm. activism that is not driven out of fear or out of hatred, but out of generous and uh, reckless uh, love for all of humanity and for all of creation. So I encourage you with that. Uh, keep us in your prayers. Uh, keep your work up, and um, I hope uh, I hope I'll get to see you soon. I'm gonna hopefully be in the U.S. in August to start my PhD studies at the University of Notre Dame. I would love to make it back to the West Coast, to the Bay Area, also as soon as I can. Um, it's 11 p.m., so I have to head out right now. So blessings to you all, and hope to see you soon. Thank you, Daniel. Thank you, Daniel. We know it's we know it's very late, and we thank you for making the time to be with us tonight. You got it. And turn uh, now to Kira. Um, I also wanted to say thank you. Uh, thank you, Dr. Abdul Hadi, for this space and for always challenging us to pursue justice and be critical thinkers. Um, thank you, Pastor Michael, for bringing us together today to speak. And thank you, everyone, for your wisdom. Um, I, I started by learning about different organizations like GUPS and LFS when I was a student at state and I ended up with the campus ministry. Uh, so I want to strongly urge at, and encourage to join organizations. Um, being a part of an organization keeps us accountable to the work that we're doing uh, in solidarity uh, or locally, it gives us space to have educational discussions um, and also space for grounding um, and if I've learned anything from being a mama and an organizer and a strong person of faith and peaceful for, for just a peaceful future, um, is that this is a protracted struggle, right? And it will not come without struggle, um, but it is our calling and our duty to learn and to grow, and it is our duty to win. And we can only do that together through solidarity work and international uh, solidarity and local organizing. Um, and I wanted to just end with the uh, quote from Asada before, it is our duty to fight for our freedom. It is our duty to win. We must love each other and support each other. We have nothing to lose but our change. Thank you, Kira. So inspiring. Thank you so much. Let's turn to Gela. Also, just to be grateful for this space and... Um, <clears throat> I just want to end by just sharing a few reflections of what I've seen um, 
being in a lot of organizing justice spaces where sometimes I'm representing the only kind of faith community and just, or faith voice, I just want to lift up the gifts that we have from the faith community in justice work. Um, the opportunity for us to continue to bring the, the moral voice into the debate, into the public space, and to lift up our faith values is very powerful. Bringing a ritual of ceremony of healing in places with people who are experiencing so much suffering um, has been a gift that we can provide. The network of resources that we can tap, providing accompaniment, walking alongside people is a gift of the faith community. And the other part that I've been very appreciative of having the Buena Vista as a home is lifting up this idea of what are we building? What is this, the building of the beloved community here on earth? What does that look like? And um, I just, I found that to be such a powerful framework when entering a lot of challenging um, spaces around the struggle that we're going to be in um, for, for a very long time together. So I just, again, thank you so much, Pastor Michael, for your incredible spiritual um, leadership and mentorship that you provide mm -hmm. for so many people. And I just, I look forward to getting to, to know you more, Professor Rabab, and um, I would love to continue to be in dialogue with you. So thank you all. Thank you, Gayla. Thanks for your continued and growing leadership uh, all over the world. Let's turn to Pastor Myrna. Thank you so much. Um, what came to my mind, I think it was Daniel and both uh, Fami who mentioned the theology of the land. It's really stuck with me. Uh, it brought to mind the U.S. occupation of Haiti from 1910 to 1934, where they managed to take out of the Haitian constitution the prohibition of foreigners owning land. And, uh, and then they were able to come in and take over the land. It made me think of Palestine and the unwillingness of uh, Israel to share the land. So uh, this idea of the theology of land is really got, what got stirred up in me today um, and this need to take rather than to share. So I will be thinking about that. I'm very grateful and thank you for for the invitation to be part of this panel today. And thank you, Professor uh, Abdulladi, for, for your knowledge of Haiti. It's so, so good to hear. Thank you so much. Blessings to everyone. Thanks, Myrna, for taking time today to be here. We know you're supposed to be on vacation, mm -hmm. um, but this was really great that you could join in today. It really warms my heart and also to hear from you today as well. Mm -hmm. So our last word today will be from Fami Manasra. Fami? Thank you very much. Uh, before I finish, it is really great to see you long time no see <laughs> and other people. And also it came to my mind uh, one of the beautiful verses that have been uttered by Jesus in the Sermon on the Mount, Matthew 5, blessed be the peacemakers. So those people who are involved in such activities, bringing uh, hope and uh, working for human rights and peace uh, for instance, for my own people in that mar marginalized community, Wadifukin, when you come to them, when you visit them, and you show them, uh, you show that you care for them and for your their human rights and their humanity, it really uh, make a huge impacts upon the people and brings them hope. And this is what we really need in that land. We need to uh, be given that hope in order to continue and we got our own rights. Thank you guys for having, for giving me this opportunity. I appreciate that. God bless you all, thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Fami, for taking time to be with us. Say hi to the family, to the kids. Right. Thank you, stay here. Yeah, so um, that concludes our time together for today. And I think we just uh, have made it on time. And uh, so today's convening, I hope we appreciate the power of convening and that Dr. Abdahadi is a master of doing that as she teaches courses at San Francisco State and creates the space to have open classrooms for community to join in. I hope you can stay in touch with her on different classes that are particularly open to the community as well for community members who've come to be with us today. For students, we hope you appreciate the community connections that Dr. Abdihadi always makes in her classes to make sure that her scholarship is grounded in 
things that are going on on the ground with organizations and people that are doing work for justice uh, always. And that I hope that this is not the last time this group will convene, but just a time for people to begin to form new relationships or renew ongoing relationships for the work that's just ahead. We know that the work that goes on uh, will continue on for um, many years and that we're building right now uh, those relationships and foundations of organizational intersection and partnership that's going to benefit kids like Linnea who are growing up mm -hmm. with us and that we want them to be the beneficiaries of the, the scholarship and the organizing that everybody does together. So with that, thank you all for the day and it's been great to be with you. <laughs>